talk of the day, awesome. Um, I wish I would have posted my slides earlier so I, I could show you how <coughs> hilarious it's going to be as we go through. Most of the stuff that I'm going to talk about, like the discoveries, have actually been talked about already. Uh, Jeremy actually put up three code examples that look almost identical to what I have on my slides. It's pretty <laughs> awesome. So I might be on the right track, I don't know. Uh, building reflow. I'm going to tell a story. I'm going to tell the story of creating this next generation app for Adobe um, from the beginnings to what we have today. And at the very end, I'm going to wrap it up with a demo of the application. Along the way, I'll show you things that we've learned, uh, tips and tricks, and hopefully they'll be interesting. Uh, so <laughs> who's this bozo? Yeah, um, Adobe. How's that Flash thing working out, right? Like, what does Adobe know about HTML, the web? Isn't this a backbone conference? Uh, yeah, so we, we have an entire team, a web platform team at Adobe that's dedicated to web. And we've been working on a lot of things, as adding to WebKit, uh, created open source project brackets. Uh, Reflow is just one of these things that we've been working on. So what is this Reflow you speak of? Um, well, let's start with the problem. So the problem that we had was I went and gave a talk on multi-screen design. And this is what you saw a lot was, you know, you had a, a website, you wanted to get it all these different screen sizes, and there really wasn't a way to see what <coughs> your website was going to look like at design time. So what people were doing was this. You would get, you know, I would get, I was the developer on the um, design team. So they would give me four, five, six comps showing what the website looked like at different sizes. And I had to kind of sit back and imagine all these different steps, you know, what it would do when it resized, how things would flow, whatnot. And most of the time, I would get pretty close, but there was really no way for me to know exactly what they were trying to accomplish. And yeah, there it is. This is what I'd be looking at all day, just be a bunch of PSDs, multiple, multiple PSDs. <laughs> so imagine someone goes, oh yeah, we need to move the button up three pixels. So they go in and up, move the button up three pixels on all the different Photoshop files. And I go in and try and figure out what that meant to my actual final website. It was a really terrible workflow. So basically what we were trying to get to was we wanted to get create a tool that could help designers <coughs> express responsive intent. So they could show the developer or themselves even exactly what they wanted the website to do as it scaled from the different uh, screens. So how did you do it? With Backbone, of course. Uh, how did we make a desktop application? The next generation of desktop application for Adobe we did it with Backbone. It was weird. I had this conversation with the Edge Anime team because they were um, much farther along than we were, and they said, "Well, what are you doing it with?" Them? Oh, HTML. Like, oh, okay, so you're just you're prototyping HTML. Yes, I'm prototyping HTML. Okay, cool. So what are you going to actually do it in? When you finally do the, the final thing, it's like probably HTML. Okay, well, we'll see how that works out. It's like okay, and so then I demoed the prototype. And the first question out of his mouth was, oh, how'd you do it? H, eight, eight, same story, same exact answer. And they said, oh, okay, cool, because we, we tried it and we actually couldn't figure out how to get the performance that we needed and the, the feel right and whatnot. <laughs> and um, I really give a lot of the credit to Backbone. And so the truth is, we iterated, we iterated a whole lot. We did uh, this prototype was a web web page in a little shell, Fluid. If you guys have heard of it, this little uh, Fluid is an app wrapper that you can put websites in and it looks like a desktop app. And we did one week sprints. So we would talk about what we wanted to try to accomplish. Um, we'd go and do customer validations. We'd research a bunch of websites. And then we go work on it for a week and then come back and whatever we had at the end of the week, we'd evaluate and decide we needed to pivot one way or the other. Uh, there was no way I could think of to get that fast of a turnaround with the features that we were putting in. 
without doing it in uh, web technology. I really couldn't come up with another way to do it. So the question that came up after that was, well, so you use Backbone, why would you use a framework at all? Aren't you supposed to be this JavaScript whiz kid? Like, can't you just write it all yourself? And the answer was, sure, sure, I could write my own uh, framework from the ground up. That's possible. Yeah, and I even started to try it. And I got done with models. I was like, oh, well, I need a model that when you set something on it, it emits an event. So I got that going. I was like, all right, cool, I got that. And I probably, I probably want to render this model in a template. So, OK, well, I got templates, and then I got to collect. You know where I'm going with this. I got to click all your and I was like, all right, well, might as well just use Backbone. Um, which is good, because then we're actually living in the same space. We're feeling the same pain as other web developers. We actually understand the space a lot better, which I think is a really huge uh, benefit for Adobe. But the final straw, the thing that won everyone over, was onboarding. Because every time you bring on a new person, they look at your code, <laughs> and they're like, what is going on? Because you know, you did your best to document it. You did your best to explain it to them. And they're like, what are you doing? And you're like, writing code, suckers! <laughs> <laughs> so it was way easier for us to point someone at the backbone documentation and Stack Overflow and not have to have that hour-long conversation about what idiots we were for not doing MVVM versus MVC versus whatever you want to do. Uh, I refer to this as the pink wheel syndrome. I think a lot of people suffer from it. It's like, no, no, I'm not reinventing the wheel. I'm just making a pink one. <laughs> it's like, well, sure, I guess that's fine. But it isn't, doesn't make it better just because you made it. It really doesn't. It actually makes it worse because I feel something battle-tested, something that's out in the community, something that people are actually pounding on. Um, I heard this really great term for it. It's called used in anger. <laughs> Something's been used in anger. It's going to be much better than something that you dreamed up. Uh, prototype. Like you mean it. This, I think, was the huge determining factor. We, I wrote the prototype. I wrote the first lines of code on the prototype. And those first lines of code are still in the Git history of the final product, right? So the only way that you're able to do that is if you prototype like you mean it. You actually write code like you were writing final shippable deliverable <coughs> code, which means you write with tests. You know, I have, I have the accusation of writing the most over-architected prototype ever created. I was like, well, I'll take that. Um, so I wrote tests. I tested every single part of it. It was test driven from day one. Um, I, you know, researched what I needed, and I was really um, pragmatic about it. I didn't just add a bunch of stuff. I and, and kept making things until I felt incredible pain, and then we refactored, right? So we actually treated it like real code. Worked all the way up to a point where we couldn't expand anymore, we couldn't scale, and then refactored that. So we had a new level to, to base it off of. Um, the we started with. They talked about it, I think Brian talked about it, where we started out with that namespace module system, right? And it slowly evolved because we started seeing people cheating where they're, you know, making an instance and then using the instance in the one page app and then having circular dependencies and then you actually had to load in the files. Um, they're order dependent. So then we're like, oh, in their module system, you know, this is how it worked. We prototyped until we ran into problems like that that were actual real world problems and then we changed things. And so, this is an example of one of the prototypes that I made early on. Um, and this is actually a, a little mini Backbone app. Uh, and pay attention to these because I'm going to show the app at the end and it'll have the final output of this. So these kind of prototypes, the interactive ones, I think are really useful, um, especially if you built it with the same technology <coughs> stack. Because you can kind of, you can get like, while we're trying to get the, the responsive intent across from the designer. I'm trying to get the actual functional intent and interactive intent across to the final implement of the of the software. So this pop-up wanted to like this. I want to be able to like copy and paste these items. I wanted to see if it was even possible. I wanted to see if I could make a template that could render the items from this model in a way that um, was actually useful to the end user. Right. Is that when we did we're talking about, well, what's the best way to make, uh, to get, a, get it across to the user that how they can move things around on the screen, right? We're replicating things that we've done for years 
in tools like Illustrator and uh, Photoshop in HTML, and we wanted to know what the best way was, uh, if it was even possible to do a lot of these things, right? And is there a way that we could get across the final intent in a way that wasn't annoying or confusing? And this is also a little, a little backbone app, just so I could try and figure out what the best way to go about it was for the final implementation. And then we actually got even deeper. Some of these are, like I said, we're reproducing things that we that we're used to in desktop applications in HTML. So how do you do that, and is it even possible? So this is our undo, redo, right? So I'm actually using design patterns that I know really well, reproducing them in JavaScript, and then trying to get it in a way that it's similar to, or familiar to people who use the desktop apps, or, or, cali or high quality desktop apps in like Photoshop. So, first code example, it's, <laughs> yeah, it's exactly what Jeremy showed earlier. <coughs> but you can see how Backbone, because it's so flexible, lends itself to implementing these design patterns in a really JavaScript-y way, right? And then you get these really, 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 really happy things like that, where it made it super easy to get the state of the attribute as, as, as it had changed. So you prototype the things you don't think are possible. And in this case, they didn't think any of it was possible. So we went through and prototyped as much as we possibly could. And I think it was probably the, I don't know, the single leading reason why it was successful. Modularity, less than refactoring. So like I said before, we have this single namespace modules. We also went down the path of trying to do um, our own AMD-like modules. And then we decided at the end of the day to go with require. And I think it allowed us to scale in a way that we wouldn't have been able to do it otherwise. Uh, I, I was kind of against it. I wanted to actually keep it more simple and require setting it up. Like refactoring to use require was really, really, really painful. But doing it actually was super, super useful. Um, we also came up with this idea. It actually looks a lot like what Brian was talking about, where we have we set up our modules in a way that basically you can work on a module individually. So you get, if you looked at our project, you would have a folder of modules and they would be named after the different parts of the application, you know, properties panel, uh, canvas, grid, right? And they all have this, what I, I call these the entry point modules, the API. I think he was calling them controllers. But basically what it does is you, you have all of your, your, back, your dependencies, you know, defined. This is the, our event map so that you can talk between the different modules. And then all your backbone instances are brought in and instantiated by this controller. We have uh, you know, a save and load because what we're doing right now is we have the entire, well, our canvas is all of the models rendered visually, right? And so we basically, when we instantiate the app, we hand off the models to the areas and they, they load, right? So but load and save, we expose this as a public API so that when the app starts up, it can go ahead and save, or it can load it up. And then, like I said, we subscribe to namespace events that come from other modules, so the modules, we can develop the modules by themselves and they don't have any dependency on each other because we can load, we can pull, put in modules and pull them out without um, making the app crash. <laughs> Multiple inheritance. Angus Kroll is a maze balls. Yeah, that's about it. No, uh, multiple inheritance. So a lot of the developers that came onto the team were from came from other languages, obviously. Came from Java, came from ActionScript, and they wanted to get this really elegant inheritance solution where they could make a base class and extend that base class and extend that base class. And then all of a sudden we got to do a case where, well, you can add things to the canvas, so we want to add view method on the canvas. Oh, but you can also add views to a box. Hmm. And canvas and box aren't really related, they just both have this trait. And so, came up with the functional mixins. 
just as a solution, I was, and I was like, I think this works really good. I think this is the way that I want to do all of our inheritance in the app. And I was like, oh, really? That's how you want to do it? And then Angus Kroll wrote this amazing article, I have a link at the end of the slides, about re revisiting functional mixins, and it's, it's brilliant. I, I would go into a big um, detail about it, but you should read the blog post, it's amazing. But basically this is it. You have a simple object with a bunch of functions on it, and somewhere else, when you want to use it, you just mix it in the prototype. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. Views, yeah. Wish we had used backend layout. Well, so when we started, there was backend layout manager it didn't exist, and we ended up going at views a bunch of different ways. The main issue that I ran into was that originally we had a lot of logic in our templates, so you could hand it a really complicated model and go through and build all these views, and it was really uh, tedious to maintain and update. And then we started breaking down our render methods because we wanted to have faster renders to smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller views and smaller and smaller <coughs> actions in the render methods. So we had a bunch of different render methods for the different parts of the view, which actually works really, really well. And it gives you really fine-grained control, which is great. But then we wanted to have a way to ba basically say, like, hey, properties panel, go ahead and be created and create all of your panels inside of it. And there was no way to specify that, that hierarchy. Um, with the way that we were doing it. We ended up having these really bloated views with these really bloated render methods. Even though we had them broken down, it was still really hard to do. So if I were to do it again, if I were to recommend what you should do, something similar to Backbone Layout Manager, use that or use Marionette's one. Uh, so <coughs> templates. We never needed more than underscore templates. It's weird. I, I talk to a lot of people that do Backbone projects, and none of them use underscore template just straight up, and I don't, I don't really know why. I, I, I even had handlebars in the project, fully intending to upgrade at some point to something more robust with all these fancy sugar syntax functions and whatnot, but I never needed it. Um, and I'm actually pretty happy about that, because when we did our final code review, they said, oh, well, why do you have handlebars in there? I was like, oh, I'm actually not using that. We ripped it out. So. The thing that got me the most, though, with templates was that we we had, like I said before, we had lots of logic in it. And we got burned enough times by having a lot of logic in our templates that we just ripped most of the logic out. R right now, all of our logic for the templates happens in preparing our models really well. And our templates are just reading things off of it. It's actually, they render much faster. There's way easier to debug and whatnot. Um, just like everything, I had to have some data behind my decisions for the architecture. And this is one of the things I stumbled upon that I thought was really interesting. I'm still waiting for someone to tell me that these benchmarks are BS, but this is Dust.js, which is the most compelling as far as um, templating because they have all this data behind how fast they are and what they can do and whatnot. But if you look, the trade-off of switching to something, like adding another dependency to your, to your list of uh, JavaScript is actually not that great, right? The, the trade-off isn't that good. Underscore actually does pretty well. If you look at handlebars, does really good for just the kind of the no-op, the string. But then as you go down, like the things that I use all the time, like underscore kind of hands handlebars its ass. So, uh, anyways. Just you asked a person to tell you that those are BS. Yeah. Um, it's uh, the BS now because underscore added uh, an option that you can do it like this does without the width. Ah. Uh, Perfect. Show me how to do it. I'll update my suite, and then we'll blow them away. All right, All right. You perfect. That for the camera. What's that? You should repeat that for the camera. Uh, so Jeremy says that he updated underscore so that you can do you can render a template without the width, and it's much faster, it's, which is basically what Dust is doing behind the scenes. Good to know. OK. Collections. Um, so there are a couple things that we ran into when we were doing our collections. Um, one was mixed models. There wasn't really support for mixed models, and we, we thought about it a lot. Like, well, do we really need to have mixed models? Do we have a collection with another collection in it? Do we have multiple collections? We don't want to manage two collections. If you think about it, what I'm, what I'm referring to is we have a canvas that has a bunch of things rendered on it. And those things are different. They're like text. Um, there's also boxes. There's you know um, colors, gradients, whatnot. They're all items that can be drawn on the canvas. But 
there was no way to represent a box model as well as a text model and basically hand the data to the collection and have it generate all the views. Uh, so we came up with something interesting where we made this mixed models. We solved the mixed models problem by having a type on the model itself and then making this view factory and just mapping it. So it basically comes in, you hand a collection all of these, you know, the big JSON object of all the models, and uh, it goes through and it looks at the mapping, it's like, oh, well, this type is a box, this type is text, and it goes through and just creates the right, the right view and hands it back. Works pretty darn good. Um, it's not the most elegant solution, but it works fine. And then this one, uh, I'll show you a demo of it, the final output of this in the type kit module of Reflow, but this is filterable collection. And again, it's proving that naming something in computer science is actually the hardest problem in coding. Uh, I couldn't come up with something better to call this filterable collection. The thing I like about this is, A, I love underscore for exposing more functional programming approaches, and B, it's, it allowed us to do something, you know, it's, it's kind of clunky, but it works really well, and we don't have this issue of like mutating our collection. We don't actually destroy or change any of the data. We actually just represent a different view on the data by using these um, these filters on it. And I can add and remove as many as I want, and I get get exactly what I need in the collection like it's the same collection. It's pretty fun. jQuery plugins. We have a bunch of jQuery plugins that we wrote for Reflow, and it was interesting. I, I wasn't sure if it was the best way to go about it, but it ended up being actually quite nice because we could write a jQuery plugin that would work on any DOM, and then we could put it into one, of, like wrap it in a uh, backbone view and use it like it's just a DOM, piece of DOM, and then we can do all the really complicated things that, um, that the great jQuery API makes easier inside this plugin, and we could use it elsewhere if you wanted to, right? It's, re it's reusable. One of these is this cartilage grid. There's, I'll show you it in the app, but this is the, the grid. It, it's, the engine is a jQuery plugin, so you basically just hand it some options and a uh, DOM uh, element, and it'll go ahead and create both the visualization and the grid itself um, in a scalable way, right? Responsive grid. So I, I thought that was a pretty fun example of a jQuery plugin. And then this is like, this is all pseudocode. Don't expect this stuff to run. But this is basically <laughs> what we're doing inside the, the backbone view. Um, I can go ahead and set it up, run the cartilage function, which is just a, the plugin, the jQuery plugin, and hand it the model, which will have the options in it. And then every time I, I call render, I'll go ahead and update um, the grid itself, just like it was the, the view. Testing. So I said this, we TDD from day one. We tested everything all the way through. And I am gonna be the dick that says this. You simply cannot make quality software without GDD. I just don't think you can. Uh, we have one guy on our team that can write perfect code every single time. And I, I called him out on it and he proved me wrong multiple times. So for him, I make an exception every now and then, but everyone else, like you need to test your code. Uh, and the main thing that, the main takeaway I think for everyone about TDD is you can't refactor without tests. You can't do it. And we did, we, we refactored every single week for 60 weeks. So I wouldn't have been able to do that at all if I hadn't had tests for every single part of the, of the application. And again, I'm repeating something that someone else said already today, but sign-on is awesome. This is, I can't take credit for this at all. Uh, Jared Wiles actually said, you're an idiot, we're not using sign-on. I was like, well, I don't really want to have another dependency in our JavaScript. Uh, he's like, trust me, it's worth it. It's like, I don't know. So then he put this together and showed me, man, it's awesome. Because I showed you before we have that kind of entry-level 
module, which instantiates all the other parts of the module. And there was no way to test it without uh, basically testing other parts of the app. We couldn't do a true unit test on those because we were testing that it could create these other objects as well. <coughs> um, stubbing these out and using Simon for that makes it, makes it possible for us to have an actual unit test, like testing the, that part of it. And then we, because we use require, we use Squire as well. And Squire is basically just the, the injector. So you can use dependency injection for your tests. And then someone asked about code coverage. We're using Sonar, and it gives you these beautiful graphs of your code coverage. It's pretty good, I feel like, code coverage for an app. So I highly recommend using this. It's great. It gives you amazing, amazing statistics. And it'll even give you hotspots like where tests break often. So you can go in and maybe look, see if there's something you can change to make it less complex. And so this is the app from prototype to production. So you saw in the beginning it changed a lot, and then as we started to solidify for demos, it stopped moving so much. Add the grid, flip the PI to the other side for some reason that's not going to. Customized our app wrapper. And you saw we did some design changes up top. We couldn't decide whether we wanted to have default breakpoints or not, and I say not. I feel like you should design your website and then you should put a breakpoint where your web design breaks as you're resizing it. You don't want to put in preset breakpoints because you might not need them You're doing extra work. So that's, that was after 60 weeks. That's a snapshot every week for 60 weeks. And then this is the final, this is a reflow. That's what it looks like today. So now I'll demo, oops. Okay. So I can walk you through the different parts that I, I talked through in the slides. First of all, you notice that there's this grid, and you can see it's dynamic. I can control the amount of columns, uh, whether it has outer gutters or not, the opacity of it if it's too much for you, uh, the gutters. And then you can see as I resize it, it'll scale. I can even do cool things like I can go down here, set a breakpoint, change the grid, maybe down here I only want three columns. And then probably at the bottom, I want just one, once I get down to like 250 or something. Do a single column. And then it's stateful, right? You can see the different states, the grid changes. That's pretty cool. Uh, you can put in elements, and then this is the part that I was pretty excited about it. You don't really notice that it's HTML at all. I mean, the performance, yeah, actually, I was wondering if it was gonna be too slow on the screen, but it's, you can see the performance is pretty darn good. Like, it's snappy, it feels native. Like, you don't really even notice that we use anything other than Cocoa for this. Um, and it has all the things that you'd expect. It has like a right click. You know, you can undo and redo, right? It's like a real app. Because <laughs> it is a real app. <laughs> that problem I was talking about. See, I was able to add a box to the canvas, and then I wanted to add something to the to the box in the canvas, right? So that's where you have this that view mix in. So adding, a, adding, a, adding an item is actually accomplished by using that view mix in. Hello, guys, people. <laughs> uh, so this is that multiple collection in action. So I can be like, oh, I want San I want serif fonts, I want sans serifs, I want slab serifs. I want that one. Uh, and then this is the live filtering. I say, oh, I want source. Yeah, source sans pro, cool. I got that one. Right, so this is doing the live filtering on that filterable, with that filterable, filterable collection. Man, I should have named it something I could say. Um, right? And then you can also go in and add your custom, you see how the, you can add your custom type kit information if you wanted to. You see how it updates as I'm doing that. Um, 
This is kind of interesting. You can do it, it defaults to rems, but you can set different types of units of measurement. That's actually a pretty fun thing to write as well, switching the measurements on the fly. So enough of me doing developer art. Oh, wait, maybe one more thing. We have this experimental tab now. This is where I'm going to be spending most of my life for the next <laughs> year or so, is adding uh, experimental WebKit features so that we can basically vet them and get you know more support around them. So this will have, I don't know, anything that Adobe works on will be in there. Scale that. Anyways. So then let's load a project. So you see here, I have this website that has all these different sizes to fit these different screens. So the 1024, 900, right? You see how it starts to rescale and resize. And then I can actually see it on the live as I'm scaling, just like you were in a browser. The cool part, like this is all good and fine, you can design, it's great, but then what do I do with it? Well, I can grab something, let's grab something interesting. I can go down here and it's basically giving me the DOM structure, home, container, featured location, okay, cool, and then, oh, remember that pop-up that I demoed, the prototype? This is the actual code that you get so that you can um, recreate this design, so you can actually extract the CSS needed to recreate that part of the, of the comp. You can save it to your clipboard. So these work. Yep, there you go. You get all the meaty queries. Oh yeah, that'll save you some time. <laughs> yeah. Um, has multiple pages. I mean, I could go on and on, but you can. You have an about page, home page, right? So, this is my demo. So the moral of the story is fail harder. You know, I, that's my new motto. You basically try something, try something, try something until the wheels fall off, and then pivot, iterate, iterate, iterate. Oh, and then the last thing. Topco is this shameless plug for the new thing that I'm working on. We actually extracted all of the UI and the CSS from Reflow, and we're open, so we have open sourced it. So you can get UI, quality UI, um, <coughs> benchmarked CSS for your own applications. Um, it's an open source project. We're actually looking for people to contribute. It'd be awesome if you guys at least checked it out. So I'm Christopher Joseph. I'm Dan on Twitter. And yeah, this is the list of the links, all the stuff I talked about. Oh, that's really cool. <laughs> um, I'm wondering, you. how come you decided to ship it as a desktop application, and then also, how do you, like, what's your workflow for shipping it as a desktop application? Okay. Why did we decide to ship it as a desktop application? It was number one. Um, why a desktop application? Well, I think that designers currently, we're just trying to basically cater to the way people work right now. Um, this also gives us the ability to, I don't know, maybe put it in the web someday, if that becomes cool, if the web, this, this web thing, you know, has any legs to it. <laughs> uh, well, let me rephrase, how come you didn't ship it as a web application? Because we were trying to cater to what the, uh, what designers currently look for, basically. They, if I told the designer go to the web and start doing your design, and they're used to Photoshop, they, they might have a really hard time with that mental gap, right? It's not that big of a gap, but it might be really hard for them to wrap their head around. Um, not saying designers are dumb, I am a designer myself, and I would have had a hard time doing it. So I think we're just trying to give them a stepping stone towards the future without kind of being like, ripping the rug off from under them and be like, deal with it! So, and then, so what, the other part of it was how? <laughs> the other 
part that you're asking what's the workflow like with that like what do you I'm curious what do you mean like so are you talked about building experimental web kit features like uh, talk about your tool chain for shipping a desktop web application desktop sure so we we have a team that's dedicated to adding new features design capabilities to WebKit. And so they're pretty focused on adding features there. And then we have Chromium, right, which is the open source version that uh, Chrome put out. And Chromium has this really awesome thing called the, what is it called? I actually don't know what it's called, but the, what we are using is CEF, which is the Chrome Embedded Framework. Um, and we've customized that for our needs, for our, our, our evil deeds. So we basically make a website. I develop, I develop most of the stuff in just in the browser. And then um, I, I cheat a little bit because I don't have to worry about all the other uh, Firefox and IE6. I, I can mainly just focus on WebKit specific uh, prefixes in, in CSS and whatnot. And then, yeah, then we, we compile it all together and launch it basically in its own browser, just without any navigation. So this thing totally runs without being downloaded as an app. Like it runs as a web application. No. <laughs> <laughs> what was the hardest problem you encountered when building this? The hardest problem? Yeah. Oh man. Uh, convincing people I wasn't stupid. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, uh, and I'm actually still not convinced that I, I but no, it was that, that was pretty hard. I think perceptions were um, needed to be changed a lot, but people were really willing to. They were just kind of like tentative, you know. Um, but technically, the hardest problem, I think, we had a really big issue with loading and saving. If you're going to be using the serializing features of Backbone, you should be doing it from day one, and which was a big mistake on my part. Um, we weren't expecting to do it that way. And all of a sudden they're like, well, we already, you can serialize from that. I was like, yeah, but is that how you want to do it? And they're like, yeah, okay, let's go back and refactor everything. Uh, so that was probably the hardest part. So how does that work? You call save on model and then to your file Yep. Yeah. So we, we, have, we use this proprietary uh, file that's called JSON. <laughs> yeah. It, yeah. Yeah, and, and a, a couple other things that we need um, for the shell, but yeah, basically. So uh, I have a question about uh, whether you have any information or, or around the differences of how big your team was versus a team working on a native app within Adobe and whether or not it was quicker to do it this way, like any stats or any information you can reveal on that? So we went from thought to product in 60 weeks. I haven't heard of that happening. Um, I think the, from like an actual desktop, and inside Adobe, that, was, that didn't happen before. We went really fast. I think we had a working, I had a working prototype of the application in a week, and we had a demoable prototype in three months. That was, that had most of the features that they wanted. Um, so as far as size of team, uh, it was two of us in the beginning. Tara Fina, who is one of the best people I know and a really damn good developer, and I were working on it um, night and day. And then we scaled the team when they wanted to make it into a real product, a real product, uh, to I think nine people. And that's about a normal sized team at Adobe. It's about nine people. And then they scale exponentially as they add features. but. Um, a, a normal like startup team, it's about nine people, so. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I mean, they're, they're uh, he asked if they were JS devs, JavaScript devs. It, it, it's, um, they're engineers, yeah. So they, and they know a lot of languages. All the, all the engineers at Adobe know multiple, multiple languages, so. Um, they're just good, solid engineers, and they, they picked up JavaScript like better than me in a couple of days. <laughs> Who's got the mic? When do you expect oh. to have a production-ready version of TopCoat? And also, do you consider that the code that's output from Reclo to be production-ready? 
Um, yes, I believe that we're using Topco internally now. Um, we, I consider all of the work that we put into the CSS for Reflow kind of Topco alpha, and all the terrible failures, failures we, we learned from while doing that actually went into the architecture of Topco. And so I think that it's, I mean, I'm making uh, phone gap apps for the mobile. For mobile, it's, it's ready. For desktop, we have to do some more work to get it to be up to design spec again, because um, mobile was prioritized higher, because we, our, we, our phone gap users were suffering a lot more than our desktop. People weren't creating desktop apps with CSS, believe it or not. So we kind of do, uh, switch gears to mobile, because people were actually building a lot of apps with that. So I think we're at dot six as of this week, and I think by dot eight we'll have production ready desktop. Um, just two quick things. One, it looks like the what you're using to make it a desktop app is very similar to what the brackets people are using as far as the, the brackets uh, frame, I think they call it, is that true? It's exactly the same. Okay, cool. Yeah, the brackets um, app shell, yeah. yeah. And then um, two, I just want to double check the rendering that's going on in that app. Is that actual DOM or is that some sort of like canvas um, rendering of DOM elements that you're you're using to do some sort of like tricky you know performance enhancement stuff? No, the performance enhancements come from debounce and request animation frame. It's awesome. Yeah. What happened? Uh, Mike. <laughs> uh, yeah, so we said when you were prototyping, you built it like you meant to <coughs> test driven development right from the start. Doesn't that go against the whole point of prototyping? Does it? Yeah. Uh, that, you, that you build stuff quickly to prove a point and go back and you build it properly. Interesting. Yeah, so maybe I should have expound a little bit on how I prototype. So, what I do is I make everything static, especially web stuff. I'll make a static version of whatever, that popover. Make a static version of that in HTML and CSS, and then I'll start to add functionality to it, right? And so the functionality part, I just test all the way through, because otherwise I'm spending a bunch of time with buggy prototypes. Um, so I feel like I'm actually able to write code faster by writing tests. So <coughs> I think if the goal of prototyping is to write is to make things really fast and prove them out. Um, I can prove them out and then I can actually keep running with them once I'm done if I haven't tested them. So I think there was a lot of emphasis when we were uh, back in the flash days, back in the, the, the glory days, no? Uh, where they, there was a lot of emphasis on just like, just bang it out, dude, no, don't worry about it, just bang it out, just do it, just do it. And then they'd be like, okay, cool, ship it. And you're like, I can't. You know, um, I just don't do that anymore. I've learned from my terrible, terrible mistakes. <laughs> so um, you mentioned at the beginning, other teams at Adobe were kind of skeptical, shall we say, about using this HTML-driven process. Yeah. How do things stand today? I think, I mean, I don't know. I, I think it turned out pretty good. Um, and people are pretty excited about this new stack because it gives us a lot more opportunity, I guess is the best way to put it. We can, you know, we could make it a web app if we wanted to now, with very little effort. So they're seeing the benefits of it, right? And the teams that were really skeptical are the ones that have just amazing. I mean, Edge Animate is an amazing product. Like if you, it's a power tool. Like all of the, all of the UI, all the work they went into, they, the, anyways, I can't really talk about that part. But all the work they put into all the UI, um, they did a really, really good job. And they're like, there's no way you could get this level of polish on in HTML. And it was, it was kind of a challenge. Um, uh, I, I took it as a challenge, and I think that they're happy with the, with the outcome. So no one really talks about that anymore. So aside from uh, saving a file, or saving a disk and loading from disk, is everything, would you say everything beyond that is HTML5 and it's JavaScript all that good stuff? Yeah, and actually the... What's the question? Sorry. <laughs> um, I was saying besides um, saving the disk and loading from the disk, is everything HTML5 and JavaScript and everything kind of would run in the browser, essentially? 
Yeah, and even the sa it's using HTML save. So, yeah. HTML save. Yeah, the, the file, file save file. API. Okay. Yeah. So even that, but it, it does have to go through a native layer. You're right. So right. we'd have to do some modifications for that part here. And give it up. <laughs> <laughs> okay.